Rita and I are delighted to introduce our current leader, the future leader of the Labour Party, and Britain's next Prime Minister, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> don't happen by accident or by chance and uh, when we put this event up on Facebook only a few days ago people started responding immediately and we have this enormous crowd here tonight several thousand of us here tonight and I understand some of the media think this is a small and moderate crowd and it's um, it's apparently the sort of thing that happens every night all over the country in political meetings everywhere um, so I just say to them, gently, um, do some maths and realise how many people are now engaged seriously in politics because they want to see change and they see the possibility of change and above all they see their involvement in how that change can come about. And to, so to those of you who have come tonight, thank you, thank you very much, but also to the many people that are following us tonight, live stream on Facebook, thank you for following us and thank you for joining in because this campaign is a campaign for the leadership of the Labour Party of course, but it's also a big discussion, a big debate about the kind of society and kind of politics we want. The, many of the um, straight media simply don't get it and don't understand it, that thousands of people actually want to be involved, their voice to be heard, their views to be listened to, and they are able to make a contribution to bring about a decent, fair and just society which is possible. That can only be done if we're all involved in a decent and respectful way. But political movements don't come about by accident. They're built on a long past, a long past of people that have made huge sacrifices to bring about elements of justice, to bring about the rights that we have. This area where this huge now church is, is a place where there's been enormous radical struggles over many years, where many migrant communities made their homes in Kilburn, particularly the Irish community. They suffered discrimination and abuse. They suffered appalling work practices. They also came together in enormous strength to try to bring justice to the building industry, to try to bring human freedom to the Who says that communities don't come together? It was Irish building workers who supported the women of Grunwick in the, in the strike there in the 1970s. And I will have forever in my mind the image of the late great Tom Durkin and Mrs Desai together on the picket line at Grunwick demanding rights of representation at work absolutely united together. They couldn't have been more different in their background, they couldn't have been more united in their principles, their policies and the kind of world they wanted to live in. <laughs> and when we were trying to bring justice for the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six and so many other of those campaigns, Every one of those that was successful, as was Hillsborough eventually, and will be or grieve eventually, it does change things. So we need to be strong in our appreciation 
all those that have gone before and that have taught us so much. Because when we understand our own history of our movement, the sacrifices that were made to found trade unions, to found the Labour Party, to found so many other justice organisations, we then have an appreciation of where our strength comes from and where, from those lessons, we can go forward. I also want you to say, if you would, a big thank you to all the volunteers who are part of our campaign. Not just those that have put together tonight's event, but all those that are working in so many other ways, on phone banks, on social media, on leafleting, on street stalls, on campaigning events, on speaking up at party meetings, union meetings, and all those campaigning groups. There's something that brings us together, and it is a thirst for a more decent, a democratic society, the socialist values that unite us. It's that that brings us together, but it's our thanks we owe to those that make sure day in and day out it happens. So thank you very much for all of you. For all of you. This is the 25th event we've done as part of this leadership campaign so far. Don't worry, there's plenty more to go. <laughs> We've been in all parts of England and Wales, and we'll be in Scotland this week. We're doing them in a slightly different way than we did them last year. Most of them are open-air events, because we usually can't find halls big enough to fit the crowd into. <laughs> and then we held in parks and streets and market squares all over the country. We had well over 3,000 people in Sheffield on Friday night. We had hundreds, if not thousands, on the streets in Leeds, in Hull, in Liverpool, in Brighton, in Cornwall, and there are plenty more to go because we want people to have the opportunity to hear the message we're trying to give, but also to bring people together in that sense of unity. What we're also doing is running it as we would run an election campaign. To say to everyone, in a decent society, your children wouldn't be leaving university with massive debts. In a decent society, you wouldn't be walking past beggars and rough sleepers when you come home at night on the train or on the bus. In a decent society, you wouldn't be ignoring the needs of those people living in bad and overcrowded accommodation. We'd be reaching out to everybody in every part and every community of Britain. So we're running this campaign at one level, yes, for the election of the leader of the party, but it's also about the kind of society we want and reaching out to people to have that discussion. So nearly all the places we go to, we also have a quite long discussion with a random group of people who talk about many things. They talk about the housing crisis that's facing the whole country, and I'll come back to that in a moment. They talk about rights of work and the problems they have of representation, of insecure employment, of zero hours contracts. They talk about that. They also talk about the way older people are often disrespected and ignored within our society. They also talk about the appalling levels of casual and determined sometimes and deeply nasty always racist abuse that takes place so often around this country. Those discussions bring people together. Those discussions to me are a good way that you hear people's views, are a good way of founding what ought to be a democratic process for policy making, not just in our party, also in our unions and in our country itself. The issue has to be how we build a strong, real and meaningful democracy within our society. Tony Benn often told me that you could draw a parallel line of the growth of democ democracy and democratic accountability with the social advances that were made. I remember him telling me, and we discussed it at great length, the way in which the principles of the English Civil War were actually about the accountability of the then Parliament and holding the then 
divine right and rule of the king to account of that parliament. But it also unleashed so many other demands, questions about land, questions about rights, questions about freedom of assembly and freedom of worship. Much of that was uh, temporarily silenced by the uh, counter-revolution that took place later on. But then you trace from the 19th century onwards the growth of democracy, the Great Reform Act of 1832, built on all the struggles of the hardship and misery at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Only a few years later, we had the first Factories Act through Parliament. Only 30 years after that, we had the principles of universal education. Only 50 years after that, we had the first serious debate about the principles of social security and the kind of inclusive society we would all want to live in. We gained the rights of women to vote because of the hardship of those that laid down their lives in many cases and struggled for the right of women to vote, inspired by earlier great thinkers such as Mary Wollstonecroft and so many others that had that idea that you had to challenge the narrative that was there. So I say that because it is democracy that we're talking about and it is the principles behind it. We can only develop as a democratic society if all our young people are brought up and grow up understanding where our rights have come from, understanding where our achievements have come from. They were never handed down from above. The NHS was never a gift from the professions or the medical industry. It was something achieved from the ground upwards. And so it is about our expression and exertion of democracy. And so there are a number of principles behind this that I want to just let you know about tonight. The first one, the principle of democracy, has to be the ground up. That you listen to what people say, they have a real voice in it, they have their opinions and ideas going forward. I tell you this, how you develop an economic strategy could be done by economists, yes, and there are good economists around who give you some very good ideas. There are also people who work in factories, in call centres, in local authorities, in many other places, who also have ideas and are frustrated that nobody is listening to them. So it is about breaking, breaking open this sort of magic circle of um, Westminster, some of our great universities, Whitehall and the boardrooms, who try to control thinking, control ideas, and control the way policy is developed. None of this is easy, but surely the principle has to be, in a real democracy, it's not just about voting every four or five years. It's not just about electing people to public office. It's holding them to account when they are in public office, but having your say at all other times on what policies are going to go forward and be developed. Because when decisions are made from the top down, and you read the history of the struggles that cabinet ministers and Labour governments have been through in the past, they're often hemmed in by this magic circle of decision-making that prevents ordinary people's views being taken on board, ordinary people absolutely ignored. Decisions taken top-down end up working for the, often for the benefit of the privileged few, not the many. Perhaps we could turn that thing around. We need to have decision-making made for the millions and not the millionaires. That surely would be the right way to do it. No, it is about trusting the wisdom of ordinary people to do things differently and do things in a much better way. And so, we have to have a more devolved democracy within our society. That devolution has to be, yes, to strong local authorities, yes, to regions and nations, Yes, 
also to citizens' assemblies. But there is a cheap word in all this which has to be challenged, and that is devolved power and all is well. National wealth is not shared equally across regions any more than it's shared equally between people. There has to be a very important and very tough role for central government in ensuring the fair distribution of resources included with the devolution packages. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up passing services and responsibilities onto somebody else without the resources to deliver them and passing on the cuts that don't look as though they're being made by central government, but in reality are. Look, look at this local authority in Brent, look at every other authority in London, look at them across the country. I've often said this in many places. You could take a map of the poor of Britain and put a red blob over each area of great inequality and great poverty. You could then take a second map of the areas of greatest cuts in central government support to the every part of this country and say use blue for the greatest cuts. I tell you what, the blue would obliterate the red. It's the poorest who are paying the price of austerity and the cuts that have been made. So there also has to be transparency in the way that decisions are made. Think, for example, if our health service was more democratically accountable and people were involved, I hate the word ordinary people, but that's one that's often used, were involved in those decisions, because none of us are ordinary, we're all individual, unique and special. Okay? <laughs> what, what any rational person have said that uh, building a new hospital through private finance initiative or building a new school through private finance initiative which ends up with an education service and a health service virtually tenants in what were publicly owned and run buildings and paying through the nose to companies sometimes that have outsourced their activities to tax havens as a way of funding public service development. Would they say that's really a very sensible way of running things? You wouldn't, most people wouldn't buy a house on a credit card. They would try to get a mortgage at the best interest rate they could. Instead, private finance initiative is a bit like building a new hospital on a credit card and you don't even own the hospital when you've paid it off. Surely we can and should do things differently. So with real transparency in that decision making, it would be very, very different. Democracy in the economy and economic decision making is also very central to much of this. And I'll come on to this a bit later as well. Democracy means an economy that works for all. It means devolving decision making, but it also means that everyone at work has a right, a right to representation by an independent trade union, a right to organize into a trade union. This isn't magic, far left extreme stuff. This is actually in the International Labour Organization Convention signed, I believe, in 1919. We are in breach of it in this country. it is about trade union rights and it's about democracy in our own party and in our own movement because we have to be held to account for what we do if we're elected into office in the party we also have to make sure that every member of the party has their rights their right to participate their right to vote their right to be heard their right to propose policy their right to put forward the ideas they want. That is not a weakening of leadership. It's not a weakening of our party. It's not a weakening of our democracy. Nothing could make it stronger than the active participation of the half million people that have joined our party over the past year. <laughs> 300,000 new members one year 
leading to a membership of well over half a million makes us the largest socialist party in Europe. I think that's something to be very, very proud of. And for those that uh, say we're not developing enough on policy, we put out a 10-point plan, a 10-point idea. They're open for development, they're open for consultation. And we've had thousands and thousands of emails in reply, sometimes in criticism, sometimes suggesting changes or improvements, but above all, there is a level of interaction and involvement. So we start with rights of work. That's why we've set up Workplace 2020, which is looking at the rights of work of people struggling to survive on zero hours contracts, struggling to survive in unorganized and often quite dangerous working environments. If anybody thinks this is all, well, a bit unnecessary in modern Britain, I urge them to look at two companies, or well, three actually, look at BHS, look at Sport Direct, and look at Deliveroo, for example, of a falling employment crisis. And then you will see the need to end the iniquity of zero hours contracts. Then you will see the need for full recognition of trade union rights. Then you will see the need for a living wage that means that, that people can survive on it. We don't have a living wage in Britain at the moment. We do have towards a million people on zero hours contracts. We have many, many more whose stress in life Real stress in life is that their inadequate, insecure, often unpredictable wages don't provide them with the money they need to pay the rent, to feed their children, or to live anything like a normal life. What we have is growing inequality in Britain, with greater concentrations of wealth at the top end and burgeoning poverty at the other end. Not right, not necessary, and has to be challenged. <laughs> Nowhere is this more, more obvious than in the housing crisis that faces Britain at the present time. I represent a constituency not so far away from here, and the heartbreaking problems of housing, of a private rented sector, some of which is very badly managed and very badly maintained, all of which is quite expensive, means that those on any kind of average or below average income then face a benefit cap, which means they cannot remain in the relatively high cost areas of London. They're then forced to move. And because they're on six months of short, short old tenancies, they might be moving every six months. What does it do? to a child growing up knowing they don't really have a home. They have a place for six months, they might go into a hostel for a few months, they might go into a short stay somewhere else, they might have moved schools so many times. Talk to a child who's changed primary schools four or five times before the age of eight and ask them what they feel about security of life. And then our government tells us that all that matters is local authorities in high value areas, most of which, but not all, are in London and the South East, must sell off valuable council housing when it becomes vacant through death or somebody legitimately moving on. And then at the same time saying that those that uh, do relatively well have got to pay to stay and end the whole concept of lifetime tenancies. Can't we do something a bit different and a bit bolder and recognise that the post-war housing crisis was dealt with by a government that was bold enough to build council housing and build it again? And at the same time, regulate the private rented sector. And it seems that regulation of the private rented sector is a bit of a problem for the Tories. And so when one of our Labour MPs, Theresa Pearce, proposed an amendment to the housing bill, which was actually 
so short and moderate, I thought it was going to go through unopposed. All it said was, any property put out for rent on the open market should be fit for human habitation. <laughs> it's not a big ask, is it? <laughs> you know, it's pretty simple, and the definition of human habitation is also fairly predictable and quite easy to understand. Too much for them. No, 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 no. They voted that one down. That is the kind of government you're dealing with. That is the kind of opposition we're dealing with. And that's why we have got to get on the front foot and say to everybody, we will invest in the housing that's needed. We will regulate the private property sector. We will support the private And there's other, other policies we have. Other speakers have mentioned the value of our National Health Service. I just want to say a couple of things about our NHS. It was the single greatest achievement of our party and our movement to establish a National Health Service free at the point of use in 1948. To show that, to show that uh, health care was a right, not a privilege. It's not a right that is enjoyed by most people around the world. And Nigel Van always said it will last as long as there are folk around prepared to defend it. Well, we're around and we're going to defend it. <laughs> but it is, it is under threat. And it's under threat in a very clever and actually quite subtle way. Very clever and very subtle because even the Tories say, no, oh, you know, health. NHS is absolutely safe in our hands. Indeed, I do even recall Margaret Thatcher saying as much, and I've heard every Tory Prime Minister and leader ever since then saying it's safe in their hands. Then look at the Health and Social Care Act. Look at the requirement of uh, outsourcing almost half of all NHS services to the private sector. Look then at the underfunding. Look then at the debt levels in every hospital and look at the drain of PFI on those hospitals and you begin to see a pattern. Underfund, longer waiting lists, longer waiting times. And then when the junior doctors stand up for their conditions, for their rights and for the NHS, they have received the opprobrium of all those who think they shouldn't be doing that. Well, let's look at things a bit differently. Look at the stress levels of those that work within the NHS, at every level within the NHS. Look at those that are porters in hospitals, racing around, trying to keep up and catch up with whatever's going on. Look at stressed out nurses and triage nurses in A&E departments. Look at exhausted and stressed out doctors dealing with A&E crises every night of the week. And then look at the stress levels of those on the ward trying to cope with the patient demand. Things then end up going badly wrong. Let's not blame the NHS staff. Let's look instead at the issues of funding of our NHS, rights of those that work within the NHS, and the way in which PFI drains so much that ought to be spent on patient care and support. We need a rethink there. But health also has to deal with inequality within our society. You could take a bus down Kilburn High Road, start at the top end, start when it's no longer called Kilburn High Road, but it's still the A5. Go further out into Hertfordshire. Go further out and you find people some living very good lives, some people have a long life expectancy. They lead a good life, they're well housed, they're comfortably off. They're likely to live longer. You go down the A5 towards central London, life expectancy falls and falls and falls. To the poor living in Goldbourne Ward in Kensington, Chelsea, the Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, one of the poorest and most deprived wards in the whole of the UK, you'll see a very different pattern of life expectancy. And you'd have to get all the way beyond Crystal Palace, having crossed all of London, before you would see that life expectancy starts to rise again. And you could make the same bus journey 
across Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Bristol, Cardiff, Swansea, any of our cities, and you would see that whole pattern. That inequality is partly about healthcare and resources, partly about housing, partly about abilities of people to develop their skills and get on in life. It is about the function of government and local government as well to invest in those communities because everybody deserves to have the longest possible life expectancy wherever you happen to have been born or wherever your parents happen to have been. But there is also a crisis of mental health within our society. One in four of us are going to go through a mental health crisis during our lifetime. One in four of us will be in a very difficult and dangerous place. Some of us will get good help and care, will get good understanding from us, our loved ones who would support us through this crisis. Some won't. Some will be ignored. Some young people will be frightened and afraid to talk about it told, you know, your abusive words would be used towards them because of the crisis they're going through. And they'd be afraid to seek any help. And the biggest cause of death amongst young men in Britain today is suicide. Now, this is a crisis that has to be faced. It has to be faced by investment in NHS mental health services, in what are often very good often quite small voluntary organisations that do a great deal to help people through crises. But it's also one that we've also all got to face by changing the way we approach the issue of mental health, reaching out to people that are going through a crisis, and recognising real parity of esteem means saying, yeah, we'll support you, we'll help you through the difficulties you're in, so that when you get through them, you'll be back amongst us just like you always were. Can't we treat mental health as part and parcel of our very being as human beings and how we feel as people. So this Wednesday we're going to be launching Diane, Diane Abbott, our wonderful Shadow Health Secretary, and I will be launching a policy statement on how we're going to take the NHS forward. And there's so many other policy areas that we're going to be developing. Others, Christine particularly, I thank her for it, has spoken a lot about education. Education for all. Education at all stages of life. All preschool children getting a chance to be socialising together, not on the basis of parental income or poverty, but on the basis of the fact they're under preschool age and they need to be socialising together and growing up together with each other. And that National Education Service will be designed to ensure that we don't commodify education, preschool or post-18. We recognise education is a right, not a privilege, and also that if somebody becomes a good nurse, a good doctor, a good engineer, a good teacher. We all benefit from it. What a waste poverty is. What a waste mathematical is. And an environment policy which is about sustainability, not just in Britain, but in the world as a whole. And I tell you, some of the most interesting discussions I've had about environmental sustainability, you'll be surprised when I say this, actually came from a very lengthy meeting I had with a group of steel workers in Port Talbot about how they access the energy they need to make the steel, what happens on recycling, what energy could be saved, how it could be done differently, and how it could be done in a more intelligent and more rational way. Who says people at work, often in a very difficult work environment, don't themselves have really good ideas about how we can do things differently. And so, an environmental policy that does respect our natural world and our environment and recognises that you cannot deal with air pollution as one nation any more than you deal with water pollution. Because if we throw rubbish off the sea in Brighton, it will end up in France. 
If Denmark or the Netherlands pumps foul air from its own industries, from its factories, it will end up with us when an east wind blows. I tell you this, there is no hiding place from pollution. There is no hiding place from destroying your environment. And so, whilst we might have good environmental sustainability regulations, we also have to try and include those in trade treaties that we make with other countries so we don't end up exporting pollution and we challenge the whole principles behind the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is about enfranchising So it's a world that we're looking at that's very different, but crucially, it's how we deal with the big central question of the economy. It wasn't nurses, doctors, teachers, care workers, Royal Mail delivery workers, homeless people, or any, of the, any other group within our society that caused the banking crisis of 2008-9. It was caused by a lack of regulation of the banks, it was caused by the greed of the banking community, and it was caused by a system that allowed it to happen. But the price has been paid through austerity, and that has hit the poorest in the poorest communities the hardest on, in all countries where austerity has been put forward. So I was very pleased when John McDonnell accepted the position of being Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I was really delighted. And only, only a few days later, John was able to explain to the Labour Party conference in quite simple terms that austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. You can't cut your way to austerity, you have to invest your way to austerity. And John has put that forward so well and developed that whole idea that we need an economy that invests, invests in the infrastructure we need, invests in the housing we need, invests in the education we need, invests in opportunities for everybody within our society. So our political movement is about bringing people together, is about empowering people, is about the cultural values that we also bring together. So next week in Edinburgh, we're going to be doing a meeting and a discussion about culture and values in our society. Not because I think art and theatre and music and drama and poetry and painting should be for the elite, for those that can afford it. I think there is a poet, a painting, a novel, a play in all of us. Let's bring it out in our children and give them that hope and that opportunity. So it's a concept. It's a concept of the policies we put forward. It's a concept about the democracy of the kind of society we want to live in. So it's an election for one position in the Labour Party. But at another level, it's about how we do politics. It's about how we develop our thinking, our thought process, how we develop our society. How we empower people so they don't have to bow down before the rich and the powerful. That their voice matters and they do have real control over their own lives and their own communities. That surely is what this is all about. And so, we aggregate together those people that have stood bravely in the past to give us the rights that we have. Those that have stood against cuts in disability payments, those that have stood in cuts to the housing programme, those that have stood up against austerity and emboldened an awful lot of other people to stand up, to those unions that have stood up when the government has come calling for their jobs and their services. And we value each other and when we come together we are very, very strong. So surely our watchword is simply this, we want to create a society in a world of peace and justice and human rights, not war, exploitation and the destruction of the world's environment. There, in our strength, we want to create a society where no one 
no area, no community is ever left behind. These are exciting times in politics on both sides of the Atlantic, all over Europe, and indeed all over the world, as people challenge the whole neoliberal agenda which was foisted on us in the 70s and 80s and say, there is no future in saying to the next generation, sorry, you're going to be poorer than we were, and I really fear for your grandchildren, they're going to be even worse than you are, goodness knows what's going to happen to your great-grandchildren. Surely, in a world of such riches, in a world of such technology, in a world of such opportunity, we can develop the politics that redistributes the world. So no community and nobody is ever left behind again. Thank you very much.